We're now going to discuss some manuscripts that were created during the Anglo-Saxon period of the British Isles. Now this would be before the Norman Conquest of 1066, so we're going to be talking primarily about the 10th and the 11th centuries. Just a reminder that during the Carolingian period of the 8th and 9th century, Alcuin and other Anglo-Saxon monks came from Britain to the European continent and they brought manuscripts which influenced Carolingian art. You'll remember that Charlemagne called Alcuin from York to be the director of his palace school at Aachen, and that after Alcuin retired, uh, he became uh, the abbot at uh, Tours, the monastery at Tours, uh, where he wrote the Alcuin Bible. So, during the, ninth, the late 8th and the 9th century, um, manuscripts and influence were coming into the Carolingian Empire of the continent, what would now be France and Germany today, uh, and uh, they were bringing uh, the, the influence uh, from Britain to the continent. However, in the 10th and 11th centuries, Carolingian manuscripts had arrived in Britain and they were influencing the Anglo-Saxon English manuscripts. So um, the influence seems to now be reversed. Now, one of the things that happened was during the 9th century, England had a very hard time of it. Uh, there were raids and devastations uh, by the Danes uh, who would raid uh, not only the seacoast and monasteries, but sometimes further inland. But after that was over, um, after the raids, after the devastation of the 9th century, there was a revival of Benedictine monasticism in England uh, in the mid and second half of the 10th centuries. And so we see the rule of St. Benedict, which was probably the preeminent Western European monastic rule, uh, becomes extremely important in England. Uh, there was a revival of religious life uh, with monasteries that are founded under the rule of St. Benedict and others, which were created earlier, are reformed uh, using the rule of St. Benedict. Some of the prominent uh, clergymen, such as Archbishop Dunstan of Canterbury and Bishop Ethelwald of Windsor, uh, which is uh, spelled as a Winchester, <laughs> uh, had direct contact with the Cluniac Monastery of Fleury in France. So we know that with the Benedictine rule um, being international, uh, that uh, manuscripts could be sent from the continent to England. Uh, and we'll see uh, an example where we, we know for certain that it happened uh, in a bit. The English monastic scriptorium are then producing books. Some of them are illuminated. And we're going to look particularly at uh, what we call the uh, Windsor or Winchester would be, I guess, how an American would say it, uh, school of uh, manuscript illumination. We're going to look first at um, the preeminent example of Windsor manuscript illumination, uh, the Benedictional of St. Ethelwald. And this is generally dated between 971 and 984, so you could call it uh, circa 980. There is a Latin dedicatory poem at the beginning uh, that says that the book was ordered by Bishop Ethelwald of Windsor. And he was the bishop from 963 to 984 and was one of the pioneers of ecclesiastical reform. And here is our translation of the poem. He commanded also to be in this book made many frames, well adorned and filled with various figures decorated with numerous beautiful colors and with gold. So we know who the patron is. Uh, it also tells us the name of the scribe who wrote the manuscript, and this is the scribe Godeman, G-O-D-E-M-A-N. Um, whether or not he was the artist, we don't know. 
It is a benedictional, and a benedictional is a book of the solemn blessings to be said by the bishop over the congregation during the Mass. So it is a service book for the bishop's personal use. It's given only to a bishop, uh, and it is used uh, to prepare the congregation for communion. Now, it seems that before every feast day in the manuscript, it uh, has the blessings for the feast day, there are two full-page pictures for every major feast. Now, some of them are missing, and I'm only going to show you two pages uh, here, uh, one of which is in your textbook, but just one other one to give you the idea of what they are. This is where we see um, the Windsor acanthus, or the Windsor foliage, introduced. and when you look at this, you see around the picture in the center, we're looking at the baptism of Christ. We'll talk about that in a moment. But around it is this uh, frame that's made up of uh, golden rectangular forms, which are sometimes called a trellis. Uh, within and uh, intertwined with are these stylized foliage, uh, in some cases stylized acanthus leaves. In the corners, you have the uh, trellis forms a kind of square, uh, and these are called bosses, actually. And so you have this rectangular sort of circle in the square bosses at the corners, uh, and the foliage, the leaves just sort of intertwine and jut out. You can barely see the square behind it. Uh, and the foliage forms either rosettes or floral shapes or crosses, it can be read either way. Now, where did they get the idea to do this? Well, one of the ideas is that it was the influence of Carolingian manuscripts, uh, probably not the Drogo Sacramentary itself, which we don't have evidence that it was ever in England, but possibly a manuscript with uh, some kind of similar uh, arrangement of uh, the, the form. So here we're using the Drogo Sacramentary, the Carolingian manuscript, uh, to compare. And you can see that you have the large letter, here in this case it's a letter D, uh, and intertwined with this are uh, acanthus um, leaves and vine scrolls, uh, even within the shape of the D. And in this case, it's the letter itself that serves as the trellis. Uh, in the English manuscript, uh, of course, it becomes a border and becomes more, much more um, rectangular in form with uh, the uh, vigor of the foliage just uh, sort of breaking through these uh, uh, bosses. So, They've taken uh, this uh, Carolingian idea of intertwining around a framework, which in that case is a, a letter, and uh, transformed it into what is known as the Windsor Acanthus or the Windsor Borders. Let's also talk about the figural style. Uh, we're looking at the baptism of Christ, which is folio 25 recto. Uh, and in it, we see very vigorous uh, linear style uh, with, uh, say, uh, very strong gestures, as you can see with uh, John the Baptist particularly. Uh, and uh, one of these angels almost seems to be um, like he's going to step and walk on the water, a very uh, uh, vigorous pose with the bent legs. If you can look very closely, you'll see that the drapery folds are highlighted with a light line next to a darker color uh, to give it a more uh, three-dimensional shape, but still very, very linear. And that the angel wings are overlapping the border. So they don't seem to want to be confined to the border. They've got it, but the figures themselves, and you can see this little river god here who's overlapping uh, the border. Um, you know, vigorous poses of John and the angels uh, may remind you of those expressive postures of the Carolingian Rem School, uh, things like the Ebo Gospels or the Utrecht Psalter. However, instead of the sketchy lines that you may remember from the Utrecht Psalter, uh, these are continuous solid lines. And this is kind of interesting. You still have a little classical motif popping up. Uh, did they uh, get that from uh, Carolingian manuscripts that were influenced by Roman manuscripts? Or you know, were there English manuscripts because they were also influenced by Roman manuscripts? Wherever they got them, uh, you have the little river god here, a personification of the river, Jordan. 
And so he's pouring out the River Jordan, which uh, swirls up over uh, Christ. Um, you may remember uh, baptisms you've seen before, um, clear back uh, at Ravenna in the baptistry of the Arians and the baptistry of the Orthodox. Uh, and you have the waters of the Jordan uh, swelling up over Christ and then uh, sort of plummeting down and uh, uh, becoming much shallower, uh, where John uh, seems to be uh, stepping into the water and the little angel behind him uh, holding a cloth. Uh, looks like he's, uh, it looks like he's about to step in the water, or maybe he thinks he can walk on the water. Uh, who knows? Angels probably could. Um, at any rate, uh, you have um, also swirling lines uh, in horizontal borders both at the bottom and at the top. Well, at the top, they're presumably clouds uh, with these uh, uh, wonderful, uh, vigorous lines. At the bottom, is that supposed to be the ground? Uh, if so, it's, it's heathing there. What, what is it? Uh, it's very exciting anyway. And I wanted to show you just one other example uh, besides the, the one picture that's in your book. Uh, this is the Ascension of Christ from the Benedictional of St. Ethelwald. And you can see that in the border now has an arch, but it still has the four bosses. Uh, uh, the, uh, the design of the uh, acanthus is similar, uh, not identical, but you've still got this active, vigorous uh, movement. And you actually have two different types of ascensions here. Uh, for those of you who can, are interested in iconography, you can think back to where you have seen Christ in a mandorla, or this body, sh this almond-shaped halo that goes completely around his body. Well, let's see, where? Um, the Rabula Gospels from the sixth century. So very early, uh, only there Christ is frontal, he's rising straight up to heaven. Uh, here, uh, Christ is uh, turned to the side. Uh, he almost seems to be striding forth, and you may remember where we've seen that. Uh, we've seen it uh, as early as, what, early 5th century uh, ascension. Uh, I'm thinking of um, a ivory that has both the resurrection and the ascension on it, and Christ there is uh, a beardless youth striving up the hill, grasping the hand of God the Father uh, as though he's going to be pulled into heaven. Well, here he's in the striding position. We also saw that during the Carolingian period. We saw, uh, for example, uh, the Drogo Sacramentary uh, ascension, uh, Christ striding up the hill, grabbing the hand of God. Well, here he's not grabbing the hand of God, uh, but he's in that striding posture. Uh, so it's a combination and then a kind of transformation because we certainly have the feeling of Christ going up to heaven under his own power uh, and uh, as this uh, divine being in this uh, I call it, uh, mandorla, which I, I call an almond-shaped body halo, so, so he's extra specially spiritual, uh, and uh, uh, he's uh, rising up uh, on the diagonal. And if you look closely, you'll see that at the uh, top under the arch, it's just uh, completely filled with the heavenly hosts of the angels. Uh, and then below you have all of these swirling lines, uh, which may be clouds, you know, as he's going up to heaven, but they're certainly active and beautiful. Um, he's uh, in the process of rising. He's not actually striding up. There's no hill. There's no uh, ground line. Uh, so it becomes uh, that Christ is doing this under his own power. Now, I want to tell you about English copies after the Utrecht Psalter. One Carolingian manuscript that we know was in England was the Utrecht Psalter. It was taken to Canterbury, to Christ Church, around 970. And there are three English copies of it. There may have been a wider influence, you know, from figure style, things like that. Uh, and we'll see some of that too. But there were three copies that were made. And these are known as the Harley Psalter from the early 11th century, uh, the Edowine Psalter from about the mid 12th century, 1150, and uh, the Canterbury Psalter from around 1200. And what I want to do is show you uh, how these changes. Uh, one of the things you'll notice is that the linearity 
and uh, some of the active postures and gestures and uh, uh, jagged drapery folds uh, influence Carolingian, uh, influence the Anglo-Saxon manuscripts. So here we have the Harley Psalter, and then below it, I'm showing you the same psalm, Psalm 11, from the Utrecht Psalter. It's a very close copy, as you can see, uh, except there's a few differences. One is the linear quality. In the Utrecht Psalter, you have these very sketchy lines. Uh, in the Harley Psalter, you're copying. So you have these continuous lines. It's, it's no longer quite as sketchy and free as the uh, Utrecht Psalter. And also, I'm sure you noticed this, uh, the introduction of colored inks instead of uh, the brown ink of the uh, Utrecht Psalter. And you'll see this uh, in the English manuscripts. Uh, they may use the linear quality, they may have the influence, but they want to add color. So you have these very uh, precise outlines, or you have these more precise outlines, these more continuous outlines, uh, and you have uh, the addition of color. Just looking at it a little closer, as you can see, uh, there's not as much shading or atmosphere. Uh, there's not as much of the dark shading and atmosphere uh, in the English manuscript. And I didn't have a colored picture of this, uh, but here is the Harley Psalter. There's a copy of Psalms 43 uh, with the Utrecht Psalter. And uh, although you can't see the fact that there's no color, you can see it's a, a pretty close copy. And then there was the Edwine Psalter. And this is uh, 1150, about that time, uh, about the mid 12th century. And we see the scribe Edwine uh, working on his Psalter. He's you know, writing the Psalter. Um, and this is actually from, uh, and this actually still is in uh, Cambridge in the Trinity College Library. Uh, the Harley Psalter is in the British Library. So this image of the author, the kind of author portrait, is an addition. It's not uh, copied out of the uh, Utrecht Psalter. Uh, but you can see certain things that you have these uh, swirling colored lines and you can see how the uh, draperies are made up of uh, a variety of uh, colored inks and even within the, uh, the areas between the folds. Uh, you have all of these decorative swirling forms. So there is that certainly that love of linearity and a, uh, the excitement of using a spiral. If you think clear back to, uh, to the Book of Kells or the Book of Duro, uh, that there's a long tradition in Anglo-Saxon art uh, of the Northern tradition of, of uh, liking decorative uh, spiral forms. Uh, and certainly there's the love of uh, color, this uh, very uh, vivid blues, uh, reds, greens. And our scribe is shown in a, uh, he's seated in a kind of architectural, uh, I want to call it a throne, but he, he wouldn't be seen on a throne, but a chair uh, with uh, an e equally architectural uh, writing stand draped with a, a fabric between uh, columns. And uh, in the spandrels, up in the corners, uh, you can see some architectural structures uh, which uh, presumably uh, refer to the monastery uh, or the church uh, at Cambridge. But now what we want to do is look at how did the 12th century artist, possibly Edwine, possibly someone else in the scriptorium, how did he or they uh, copy the Utrecht Psalter. So here we're looking at Psalm uh, uh, 43 again. And in this case, you can see that they're even less sketchy than the Harley Psalter. Uh, the lines have become much harder uh, with very bold outlines. Uh, there have been borders placed around the edge. Uh, so they evidently do like borders and they're very attractive uh, little decorative forms on the borders, uh, but not that open atmospheric feeling that you would get from the Utrecht Psalter. The addition of color, of course, uh, continues here.
you might also notice that some of the costumes have been updated. Uh, the soldiers, for example, uh, some of them are wearing um, contemporary military helmets and carrying broadswords and, and shields uh, that uh, reflect the contemporary military uh, practice. And here we see uh, the comparison between the Apostles' Creed, once again, colored ink, solid outlines. And you'll notice how the rocks have once have become stylized. They almost look like, like a great uh, fan or uh, peacock feathers or something like this over on the um, the upper right and uh, right center. And uh, you can compare those with the Utrecht Psalter's uh, sort of shaded uh, cliff-like form here. Uh, all the things we've said before, you have a border, uh, bright colors, uh, it's a little stiffer. Which would be expected of a copy. And then we're coming right into uh, the uh, full-fledged Gothic period, uh, the High Gothic, and the uh, Canterbury Psalter. So this is also still at Canterbury, uh, and it has uh, completely transformed the Utrecht Psalter into a Gothic manuscript. Uh, now we don't have just the outlines, we have solid forms, uh, they're, uh, they're wearing the military armor of the day. Uh, Let's see, uh, and uh, the um, spaces uh, between the different sections are sort of uh, uh, have lines surrounding them as though they are uh, each in their little space. Uh, God, Christ, oh Lord, why are you sleeping? Uh, the Lord is waking up at the top, uh, but he has a uh, sort of a rainbow. Uh, half circle uh, separating him for the rest of the scene uh, and uh, you can just see the transformation in almost 400 years. Everything is compartmentalized. Now we want to look at a couple of manuscripts that are influenced by this type of style that came in with the Utrecht Psalter, um, but are different subjects. They're, they're taking the style and uh, they're, they're not copying here. Uh, they're adapting the style to the subject that they're working on. And you will remember there were uh, crucifixions in the Utrecht Psalter, but they were very, very tiny. Uh, and we saw the introduction of uh, the suffering Christ, of Christ hanging down on the cross. And you certainly see some of that iconography here. Uh, Christ is not perhaps swaying as dramatically, uh, but uh, swaying just slightly to the side. But his, his head has fallen down, his head is lowered, and his arms uh, are uh, a kind of, uh, instead of going straight across on the, cro on the cross, they are uh, forming an arc as they hang down a bit. Um, you see that idea of the jagged outlines that we saw with the Utrecht Psalter and even the hunched figure. There is Mary, you know, hunched over, uh, wiping her eyes on her drapery with all these little uh, drapery folds that you, you may remember from the Utrecht Psalter. You just saw it a minute ago. Um, and then uh, John has this strong uh, gesticulation of his, his arm uh, coming out and holding a banderole, a scroll, uh, with the uh, scripture uh, on it. One of the differences, of course, is that the outlines uh, don't have quite as sketchy a quality, particularly as you can see the body of Christ. And they are in color. So that love of color continues. And uh, here we see an example, uh, the, a, uh, one of the crucifixions from the Utrecht Psalter. Um, it's uh, slightly different, but you can see the jagged folds. You can see little hunched uh, uh, backs of the figures of John and uh, and Mary, and how the uh, the way Christ's head hangs down, and how the arms uh, sway down slightly. And uh, these are all characteristics that we do find uh, uh, in a larger scale uh, on the Ramsey Psalter. And uh, there's another one of the uh, little tiny crucifixions from the Utrecht Psalter.
this is very unusual iconography here. This is called the New Minster Prayer Book. And it dates uh, to the 11th century, about 1023 to 60, to 1060. Um, it's been called a quinity, uh, which is a very strange term. What it is essentially is a trinity. So you have God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, plus a virgin and child. So I'm going to talk to you about the iconography in a moment. Uh, but first, we just want to point out uh, what we've all said before, that the influence of the Utrecht Psalter uh, continues. And you see these uh, colored outlines with the fluttering hems. And the gestures, uh, you know, are Sometimes very strong gestures with the hands, uh, as you can see, of uh, God the Father and God the Son here. The large hands. Uh, this is in the uh, British Library, as you can see, in London. Now, I want to talk to you a little about the iconography, which is uh, most unusual. As I said, someone's called it a quinity. <laughs> um, I'm not sure about how you would talk about that theologically. Uh, but essentially, you have, as I said, a trinity. Uh, you have God the Father and God the Son as an adult, and I'm not quite sure how you can tell them apart. Uh, uh, one perhaps has a slightly longer beard, but the two uh, uh, f figures seated, holding books, and they seem to be conferring together. And then the Holy Spirit is the dove who is perched on the head of the Virgin Mary. <laughs> Uh, Mary is crowned as Queen of Heaven, and she holds the Christ Child holding another book, as you can see, presumably all Gospel books, uh, the Word. And uh, she seemed to be uh, uh, eavesdropping or kibitzing or something. She's sort of looking over the shoulder. So essentially, you have uh, Christ twice as uh, the adult uh, figure in the uh, Trinity, and then again as the child on Mary's lap. And it's been suggested that this may refer to Christ as both his divine nature, where he is co-eternal with the Father, as the Nicene Creed says, uh, and also his human nature, where uh, he became um, God incarnate. He became human, uh, took on human flesh, which is certainly referred to uh, with Mary holding her uh, child, who is both human and divine. All five of these figures are unified by the uh, geometric shape, the circle, uh, which could certainly refer to heaven. Uh, and then you have this arc, which possibly is a, a rainbow, although it's little, little circles here rather than stripes, uh, on which uh, God the Father and uh, God the Son and uh, possibly Mary. Well, I think Mary looks like she's standing, but possibly Mary are seated. Uh, to show their victory over heresy and over evil, over the devil. Uh, you see down below a medieval hell mouth, this big monster mouth open up, and you'll see that uh, God's feet, or are they Christ's feet, <laughs> uh, are on top of the devil who is bound and falling into the giant hell mouth. Uh, so uh, we often see in uh, medieval art and actually in other cultures as well, when they want to show a victory over your enemy, you stand on the enemy uh, and show that you are victorious. We see that uh, motif here. Uh, on either side of the hell mouth, once again chained, uh, hunched over uh, as though uh, they are down in hell, which is presumably what is down here, is our uh, who was a early Christian theologian who was considered to be the arch heretic uh, because he did not accept that Christ was co-eternal with the Father. Um, and um, then there was uh, Judas, um, who of course is the great traitor, the one who betrayed Christ uh, to his enemies so that he could be crucified. To summarize all of this, Carolingian art, especially the direct influence of the Utrecht Psalter, is an important influence on Anglo-Saxon art of the 10th and 11th centuries.